Welcome to the UPoker Academy Poker Lecture Series designed to make you a better poker player. This is a lesson in the heads up focus of the curriculum. Here we are sitting at a heads up table with a player B. Harris and we've just sat with him so we don't have any reads but we are going to try to figure out how he thinks and how we can, we can exploit him. So this first hand we have 8-6 we raised before the flop and it was called and we bet the flop and he called again. So we are just going to check it down, given that we do have bottom pair. And we're going to note that he did play his ace-10 relatively passively. This might have been a good place to re-raise before the flop. So we might have a uh, passive player on our hands. Here we've got king-jack, and he has raised to two, so we are going to re-raise. Uh, it's a relatively good hand to re-raise no matter what. His raise was small enough that a re-raise is reasonable, and we do know that he is um, a passive player. Now, often passive players uh, telegraph their hand with a raise, and it's a mistake to raise against them, but we are not confident that that is this player type. Um, there you see he did fold our bet on the flop, so he is not a calling station, to say the very least. So we're going to stick with our strategy of raising any two cards on the button. We have three, four. Um, and it is a weak hand, but we are going to raise and c-bet the flop. And we would be c-betting any flop at this point, whether we hit something or we didn't. We are c-betting two-thirds of the pot, and he does call. And last time he did call with ace high, and then checked it down afterwards, but the chance of him having ace high on this flop is very rare, so we are just going to see if we can't check this down. And he did have a middle pair, he called our raise with jack-8, so he is playing very loose uh, from out of position. These are all good reads to start intuiting about this player. But we are uh, looking for exploits, so we are going to start trying to raise different sizes before the flop, um, play different after the flop, just to see what feels right against him. So this would be a good hand to try an overbet before the flop because we want to see if he will call larger raise, raises before the flop. And he does call. Um, this is a great time to see if we can get a large pot developed. We do have a pair and there is an ace out there. So if he does call this with anything but an ace, we know that when we do have a top pair type hand, we can milk him for all of his money. So we are just going to turn and check it down here. We do have the two pair on the river, but there are lots of draws out there. Uh, this is an appropriate spot to call. He could have the jack. He might not, though. And he does have the ace. So he did call larger than normal bets, but he did have reasonable hands when he did it. So we're not going to be able to make the determination yet that he is weak to big pot play. We're going to have to keep playing and see what comes from it. So let's see how he responds to wet boards in the flop. Let's see what he calls a bet with. This, uh, this is just a feeler bet. Um, we're not necessarily going to commit to this hand, but we do have some outs if he does call us. And essentially we want to see what kind of hands he'll just go away with. And he did go away. So not many reads to have yet. We are just going to continue our strategy of raising the button and feeling the waters. So we've, a, we've got an ace, we are just 12 pick blinds deep, so this is a good spot to just go all in right here and pick up his dollar. And he does call with jack nine. Looks like he is going to win this pot, um, but it is worth noting that he will call lar large raises with uh, relatively weak hands. It was suited and connected. That doesn't make it any stronger of a hand to go all in with. It was actually a pretty weak hand to call with there. So that's going to help us out as we as we start to figure out how he identifies what hands are strong. So here we do have top pair on a paired board with a good kicker. This is always a risky spot to be in. Often I will check back here on the flop. We want to make sure that we only put in um, two bets on this flop. Um, so we are going to bet the turn and if he calls the river. 
There's nothing to indicate that he is going to call this turn. Um, and there's nothing to indicate what hand he might be calling it with. So this is a question of whether we should value bet this river. Um, our hand is splitting the pot with any queen, losing to any jack, losing to any ace, and beating any nine. So if he did happen to catch the nine, he probably would call here, but he w wouldn't have called the turn with just the nine. So is it a reasonable value bet on the river? Probably not, because he's not going to call with the king eight that he just showed down. So we're only getting called when we are behind, which makes it a bad value bet. So we check it down. Here we've got three jack. Um, even though it is just a minimum raise, that's a very, very weak hand. Probably not even worth putting in the extra dollar there. Nonetheless, from end position, it's worth playing. Now we do flop top pair. That's going to be worth a C bet. So we are going to bet out two, and we have identified that he calls with top pair, so we are going to try to get the rest of the stack in. The easiest way to do that is going to be to bet five and then nine. And once we hit the two pair, we're not afraid of anything, no matter what comes on the Turner River. Then we do take it down against the middle pair. So what that says to me, calling down with the middle pair there, is this player is vulnerable to big pot play. And we're going to try to flop good hands and exploit that. So we are going to raise any two cards on the button. And you'll notice we are varying our raise sizes from two to three. But it's not based on the quality of our hand, it's based on the size of his stack. When he has um, a larger stack, like 40 chips or more, we're raising three. When he has a shorter stack, just 10 or 11 chips, we're only raising to two. And this is typically the best way to do it. It's often still um, too short at 40 big blinds to make a three times raise. That is really the cutoff. Um, if we were at 30 big blinds, it probably wouldn't be a good idea. So we are going to lead out here. There are two high cards. He most likely doesn't have either of them. So we're just going to steal the pot with that raise. This might be a go another good time to raise three. If it gets any shorter, we'll go back to raising two. But 8-7 suited is a great hand. It plays well um, in big pots, so we are going to try to allow ourselves to build a pot in which we can take a stack again. And we do flop three high cards, which he most likely doesn't have, and, more importantly, the flush draw. This is a fantastic spot to semi bluff, and we are going to semi bluff big big enough that we can't take his entire stack if we do hit the flop on the turn. Most of the time he will just fold here, and that is what we're hoping for, because that way we don't have to hit a flop, uh, hit a turn to make uh, any more money. So can we see bet the turn? That is the eternal question. Um, we have to calculate what percent of hands he's going to fold if we bet, and if he's got any pair, he's most likely not going to fold it to a bet, as we have seen him call down with middle pairs, and we are getting about 16% equity for our making our hand. Um, it's most likely going to be a check there against a little bit of a tighter player, it might have been a bet. So he does lead out on the river, and that's our cue to fold. Another great spot to just lead out. Um, he has been folding a lot of these flops when he completely whiffs. So every time we see a very dry flop, one that doesn't hit many hands, we are just going to lead out. Jack 8's a reasonably good hand, plays well, um, 
if you can play it right. It's got a couple of middling cards and it often makes middle pairs. Uh, but it can make uh, a tricky two player pair or a straight. And here it's come a relatively dry flop. We are going to see bet. Uh, we're see betting every flop, but especially flops like this because most likely he has a hand like ours where he's completely missed the flop and he's just going to fold. If he doesn't have a pair here, he's got very few outs to get one. So when he does call our flop bet, and the turn brings the ace, there are no draws on the board, so we can't assume he was calling with a draw. He's almost certainly calling with a pair. So we are going to simply check the turn. And the river doesn't help us. Um, since he did call the flop, we expect him to call the river bet, so we are just going to check this down. I don't think that bluffing here has much value. And he does bet out with a slide over bet to the pot, and we do fold. So that might have been a good flop to lead out on, but I was concerned that there were some draws out there and we didn't have any outs if he did have a, a hand that beat us. So I chose not to lead out. Uh, with the jack-10, pretty good hand. And we raise, and it is called another great flop to see bet on. Of course, as we know by now, just about every flop is going to be great to see bet on. And I'll see how he responds. Yep, so he is still capable of folding their C bets. Um, is he vulnerable to small ball or long ball is the question I'm wrestling with now. If he's more vulnerable to small ball, we are going to transition our strategy to exploit that, but we're still working on the premise that long ball is going to be our best bet. So here we've got quite a few outs. We've got the queens, the sixes, and the hearts, which gives us uh, 9 plus 3 plus 3 outs, or 15 outs, which means unless he's got the mage straight already, or somehow has a significantly better flush draw like the king or the ace we are significantly ahead so we are going to go on and we raise him here and try to get it all in because we have such good equity on our draw we are ahead of any five and we are slightly ahead of probably two pair at this point does call and it leaves us the only choice to jam on the turn. We still have about 40% equity to win this hand, in my opinion. Jamming does give him the opportunity to fold, which is our ideal response since we do just have draws. He has time banked, so we know that he doesn't have the made straight or a really really good hand so most likely our equity is better than what we expected it to be. And he does call, he does just have the five so we did make the right choice all along that hand. Um, by jamming the turn we gave him the opportunity to fold his weak top pair and we did have significant equity on the flop because we also had three outs for the sevens which gave us something ridiculous like uh, 18 outs, which made us a significant overdog when we made the flop re-raise. So with the eight queen suited, we are gonna make a raise and we're gonna see about this flop. Definitely uh, want to recap the hand that we had before against the ace-5 with the overguards, the flush draw, and the straight draw. The fact that he did call that turn and put in quite a few uh, bets with just a top pair indicates that we were right in our initial assessment that he is weak to 
uh, big pot, so he did build a very large pot with a very weak hand, and that's going to be great for exploiting him moving forward. So with the king six, we've got most likely four outs here, maybe seven. So we are going to see bet it and see what happens. The turn does come with a queen. He has been known to call um, the flop with just a gut shot draw, but against gut shot draws, we're actually winning because we've got the king kicker, and so we've got him. Um, if he's got the 10 something, then we've got him out kicked. So we're just going to check it down. We did counterfeit the jacks, and we do take it down. Notice here we're playing short stacked. Uh, for that reason, I am going to go on and rebuy. I'd rather have uh, more chips against a player who's vulnerable to large pot games. Of course, this is a ridiculous thing to do in a act in a game with a rake. Fortunately, at these tables, there is no rake. So we are just going to call here, but that adds absolutely no value in a raked game to make a play like that. Sometimes if I think a player has fold any check uh, checked, I will mid bet out and hopefully if he's not paying attention I'll take down the pot, but there's nobody who doesn't see this trade directly on the board. So queen king out of position. It's a strong hand, so we are going to re-raise to four times the big blind. And he folds. If he had called, we would be c betting any flop. We've got an ace on the button. It's going to be a raise. He seemed to think a little longer than normal on that. And just like every other flop, we are going to see bet and take it down. So this this opponent seems to be vulnerable to both small ball and long ball. Um, if we do flop a hand, we are going to make large bets to try to get him to put his stack in. But if we don't flop a hand, it looks like we can still make small C bets in order to get him to fold. And that's... Uh, it's going to be an actual interesting mixed strategy to make small bets on the flop when we don't have hands and large bets on the flop turn in river when we, when we do have hands. So now that we've got him pretty well figured out, I'm going to go on and raise the size of my bets. That'll allow us to exploit him more efficiently. And now that we understand exactly how to exploit him, we want to get as much money in the pot as possible. That 10 actually helps us because it makes it more likely that he doesn't have a 10. So we are going to lead out again since we know he is vulnerable to building pots with weak hands. We are going to go in and bet three streets here. Um, simply because the third street is only a $6 bet, it's a very cheap bet to make.
So we do flop bottom pair, that will make this an interesting hand to play. We do have to lead out here, because we do want to fold off two higher cards who do have outs against us. Um, but we don't want to go too far with that hand, because if he calls on the flop, he most likely has us beat. Of course, there were lots of draws out there, which makes it difficult for us to determine, say, if a 9 was to come, who was ahead. And it might actually cost us a lot of chips. That's why we keep the bet small, and essentially use feeler bets in that position to determine how strong our opponent's hand is without getting ourselves overly committed to the pot. So in the 3-4 out of position we're not looking to do much. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of times you've seen us bet um, flops out of position, but with 3-4 that's going to be a weak hand to even bluff with. So we are just going to check it down no matter what comes. So again, the strategy we're operating on is this opponent doesn't call if he doesn't have a hand, but if he does have, have a hand, he tends to call all the way down to the river. So given that, the best way to exploit him is to, uh, to get a good hand, like this one right here, and bet large when we do have it. And when we don't have a hand, to bet very small. So queen nine is a relatively good hand. We like raising with hands like queen nine because they make straights, they make uh, top pair. They leave us lots of options. So the five four out of position, reasonably good hand, definitely worth a call here. And we do flop the weak straight. Uh, we're looking for three ideally, um, and eight helps us, but it makes us the third best straight and with the paired board. We're not even guaranteed to win if we do get the straight. So do we bet here? Um, most likely not. It's probably just going to be wasting money given how dry the board is. He's definitely got a better hand than us. The river might have been an interesting spot to bet, but it most likely folded on the river. So I think that was a mistake. I could I could have bet the river. So king eight's a fine hand to play. Uh, two cards uh, above eight make it a reasonably good top middle pair hand. So we are going to raise that and see what flops. Five nine suited out of position. Uh, luckily, we're going to see it for a check. We don't like to call with a hand that's so disjointed. Now we do flop bottom pair with a gut shot. So that gives us probably somewhere around eight outs. That gave us some more outs, unless he's got a spade. So we are going to bet again, since we stu do still have the 5, and he could just be drawing at this point. Uh, there's no reason to value bet the river, though, because he's not going to call us with anything that we are beating. With the ace, we'd love to see a call. Um, if we can flop a top pair, we know that he is willing to call down with middle pair, so we would bet this hard. Uh, but we do just flop the three. There's no reason to believe that he has the five, even though he did the donk bet, which generally indicates that a player's hand has changed in some way. Uh, but we do have a three with the topmost kicker, and that means we do have to put in a raise here. And he calls. With the six on the turn, uh, we're not really too terrified of it. We don't expect him to be playing with a straight draw here. Uh, that would be a very weak straight draw. It'd be two weak cards that we'd have to play essentially before the flop. So we are going to make another bet here. Um, how we play the river is going to depend on what comes in the river. There is always the possibility that we get raised here, and if he have, if he has a five, this would be the place two raises. 
So if we do get raised, we are going to fold. Most likely, though, we put him on a week three. Especially given the time bank uh, that he's used. I think he's almost certainly got a week three here. So now we're back up to effective stacks of 63, which gives us a little bit more room to maneuver. Here with the ace five suited, we're just going to call the men raise and see a flop before we make any committing moves. We do flop second pair with the top kicker, and a great turn for us. It gives us lots of outs with the flush draw, so you are going to bet this. If he's got a king, he's got a king. If he doesn't, he'll most likely fold here. And an eight on the river, this is a great place to check it down. The chances of him calling with a weaker five or a three are very low, considering what else is on the board. And he did have the flush draw, which we would have stacked. Interesting note, if a flush card had come on the river, um, our decision would have been to go all in rather than to simply see bet for about eight or ten chips because going all in has a higher payoff when he does have a flush and the fact is he's probably not going to call a, C, uh, a river value bet um, unless he did have a flush and he did catch it. Essentially kings at that point are a very small part of his range compared to flushes. So going all in actually makes us more money because every time he has a flush, we make 60 chips, whereas every time he has a king, um, if we just see bet, you know, we might get six or ten chips out of him. So he has bet very low. This might be an interesting spot to check raise. Um, we do have two over cards, so if we do catch the queen of the nine, we might be ahead. And his bet sizing was really off. If he had a four, you'd think he'd want to make a little bit more money here. So he did call, which could indicate a draw or an eight. Um, since we did check raise, it is our obligation to bet again here, in case he did just call with two over cards, which is always a possibility. Notice we're betting small relative to the total size of the pot because we don't want to build a gigantic pot here. And he does fold to the turn bet. So there's not much that we can uh, look for on this flop, and it's too connected to try a lead bet here, so we're just going to check and fold. The great hand now, the suited jack-10. We're not going to get to play with him. Yeah, we do flop the gut shot with the overcard, so it's going to be a bet out. And we do hit the gut shot, which is expect exactly what we're hoping to do against this opponent. That's going to allow us the opportunity to bet pot on two more streets and hopefully get called down by a weak hand. He does call us here. And the 8 on the river doesn't scare us at all. We're just going to go on and throw another pot size bet out. And he does find a call with the 10 with a weak kicker. So this is exactly the kind of hand we were looking for. But we do have a strong hand and we build a big pot and we get him to call this something weak. From the third hand in this game, we set ourselves up to exploit a mistake like that. We used our reads, we used our poker hacking tactics to identify that he is vulnerable in big pots. We said that we're going to look for a big pot hand and we're going to bet it hard when we get it. And now, coming to the end of our video, we find that our strategy did pay off in the end. 
So thank you for joining us at New Poker Academy. Please check us out on riskoriented.com for more poker strategies delivered directly to your YouTube account. Please like us and subscribe to us. And for more poker strategy right now, continue on to the next poker lecture by clicking in the box at the bottom left of your screen.